thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, to this forum. Um, because I now make academic, and I think um, I don't have to speak very um, uh, officially, so I sit here. My superstition is that if you sit here, then it's off the record. <laughs> if you stand there, it's more official. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and also, that uh, because I'm, a, I'm an, an academic, I'm not allowed to be as passionate as you are. Um, um, and so, That's Tony. <laughs> uh, but, and also, uh, it's not in my place to summarize the successes or the failures of the uh, ethnic community or uh, their media. But I think it's probably, but I do, I would like to share with you um, some of the research findings I have, which more or less point to the questions of challenges as well as opportunities rather than success and, uh, and, and, uh, and failures. Um, I just remember that uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, when I edited a volume um, published by Rutledge called Media in the Chinese Diaspora, and that a volume had eight chapters, including the Chinese language media in Southeast Asia, in North America, in Australia. And back then, it was a relatively simple, straightforward affair. I simply asked my academic colleagues in these countries to give me an account of what the Chinese language media was like in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in, North America, in, in Canada, in the US, in New Zealand, and in Australia. Uh, of course, despite the divergence of different uh, experiences, there are some common concerns, but the, the, the picture was reasonably clear. That is, uh, you have um, three quite distinct domains, if you like. You have, on one hand, the Chinese language newspaper, what we called here the so-called ethnic media, and I have the problem with ethnic, the ethnic media, but it's not, this is not the place for me to critique that. Um, uh, and then in the middle, you have what we called mainstream uh, media in Australia, we call it mainstream Australian media. And on this side, you've got the Chinese state media. And then you've got these three domains, they're relatively distinct and relatively separate from each other. And uh, all I had to do was to collect the data uh, um, provided by these authors and put it in the book. Now, come 2013, I'm organizing another panel for an uh, international conference in Dublin this year. And on my panel, I have five speakers, uh, uh, including a, a speaker who looks at the Chinese language media in France, another one looks at the Spain and Italy, and the third one looks at uh, Australia, the fourth one looks at New Zealand, and my own paper is going to look at the Chinese language newspaper in South Africa, where I did some research recently. Now, the pictures is very, very different, and uh, the developments are quite dramatic. And so what I want to uh, talk to you about today is really what has really happened during the uh, um, last decade or so, if you like. Um, of course, it's very hard to generalize and give you a very clear um, picture, uh, uh, answer as exactly which moment that happened and exactly what happened, exactly what triggered that. But there are some developments that are actually quite discernible, and uh, uh, Stan has already uh, alerted to that. Um, but, um, but first of all, for instance, the most important, I think the most important, uh, not the most important, one of the, the three developments, if you like, is uh, that what was alluded, alluded to quite um, uh, repetitively, this, uh, repetitively this morning, that was the, uh, the development of new technology. Uh, online technology, the use of the blogging, the increasing use of the website and, and the social media, which make it very, very difficult for people like Simon Cole um, to uh, maintain uh, the business as they have maintained for the last uh, so many decades. And their population is aging, and they do not know what to do to attract the young audience. And uh, um, that, that is, that, that's a very important sort of a development. And in academic world, the word we use um, is a very long and ugly word, but it's ne nevertheless quite useful for us to explain this situation, this phenomenon. It's called deterritorialization. What it does mean is that no longer, it is no longer uh, the case that, that the people in China read the state Chinese media, the Chinese people in Australia read the ethnic Chinese media, and uh, those who can read the English and Chinese can read both ethnic Chinese media and the Sydney Morning Herald. It's no longer as simple as that. Okay. Um, um, for instance, a, a, a Chinese student now 
enrolled in Sydney University may uh, log on to Facebook and um, associate and, and communicate and socialize with his or her peers at Sydney University. But at the same time, she would actually go to some of the um, Chinese uh, uh, social website, Xiao Nei, or something like that. Lots of that, lots of that in China to actually talk about what's going on uh, um, with Chinese students in Beijing. And so you don't, the, in, to some extent, where you are, the notion of a place is becoming less and less relevant. So very conceivable, conceivably, you have this case of a Chinese person in Australia, in and out of Australia for some reason, but actually simultaneously consuming the state Chinese media, the ethnic Chinese media, and the mainstream language, uh, Australian media at the same time. Now you've got to ask the question, what is going on in that person's mind? And what, where his cultural, ideological, and political allegiance lies? And of course, it is never a very straight and simple forward, uh, simple uh, question. Now, one example that I can give you to showcase how complex this is, is uh, the incident that happened, I think, last year to a couple of Chinese students who um, were assaulted at the train station in Ula Creek, right, the Chinese students that happened there. And uh, um, the uh, Australian local newspapers did cover that but they um, covered it in a very um, matter-of-factly kind of way, and they did not think it was, uh, there was racial dimension to it, and they covered it as a kind of, a, just kind of crime story. But the students who actually experienced this actually strongly believe there is racial dimension to it, and he used his Twitter to uh, relate his experiences, and uh, that was picked up very quickly within the space of a day or so. It was picked up by the Chinese students, by the uh, Chinese students in Australia, in New Zealand, and in the Chinese uh, as, um, social media in China, as well as Kevin, uh, Kevin Rudd, who uh, personally actually tweeted and support and he offered his support, moral support to the Chinese students. As a result of that, Kevin Rudd's popularity uh, went just uh, quite high among the Chinese <laughs> student tweeters on that day. But what in, what's interesting about that is that the state Chinese television, CCTV, and a few Chinese media in China picked up from the Twitter that actually came from Australia and then made that official news in China. Now, you tell me where does the Chinese state media lies begins and where does of, uh, outside Chinese uh, media uh, 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 ends. So that is, you know, that's, that, that's one um, uh, development. The other development is related to the, to the development of technology is the increasing level of mobility and the movement of the people between the people in, in, in China and in Hong Kong and other diasporic locations, and, and the so-called the host nation. Um, once upon a time, you've got a migrant come here, settle down, and start a business, get a job, and become a migrant, and that person is ethnic, right? Now that person goes in and out of Australia, traverse the border between China and Australia on, on a weekly basis, and not only, you don't, not only have migrants, you have a, a large number of Chinese students. And, and in addition to that, because of the rising middle class and, and the increasing disposable income in China, you have a huge um, a sort of influx of tourists who come to Australia, Chinese tourists who come to Australia. Now, when they come to Australia, they also would like to um, consume Chinese language media. And they can be quite indiscriminate as to uh, uh, what is the nature of this media, whether it's a Chinese official media or it's the Australian media comes from SBS or whether it's actually um, the media uh, um, provided by um, Mr. Simon Coe and his colleagues in, 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 the, in the industry. So because of that kind of high level of uh, mobility and the movement between people, it is increasingly difficult to actually say who is a migrant, who is not, because most of them are in the world Again, the academics like to use funny words. The other word is in a very limited, liminal space of, of becoming, right? Just because you're a student now holding a student visa does not mean next year you're going to be, uh, you're not going to become a migrant. So, uh, uh, and then just because you're Australian, Australian citizen or permanent resident does not mean that you do, you do not hold ideological allegiance to the PRC. And they could very well be the people who join the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, 
um, anti-Tibetan sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, a protest in in, in Canberra, uh, and they're actually they're quite actually uh, in sympathetic to the the uh, Olympic Games during the uh, torch relay that you probably all quite familiar with that scenario, right? So it is again is quite complex. The third scenario, the third development, but it's probably the most deciding and the most important factor is uh, the uh, unstoppable ambition to push the Chinese state media outward globally, outside, into the diasporic, into the uh, 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 global media sphere. And the, 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 uh, that has uh, picked up this uh, speed um, um, for, for, for half a decade, and uh, they has become a number one sort of initiative on the behalf of the Chinese propaganda department. And they have um, invested a lot of money, six billion US mm. dollars is the number that's, that's been touted around. But the of, of official policy is as, um, the official policy is that as far as actually it is good to push the Chinese media outside, there's no ceiling on the budget. Okay, so what the Chinese government and its media has done is adopt a number of pathways. One of that is to try to establish a partnership with the Chinese language press outside China. So, uh, and the metaphor they use to describe this kind of initiative is to borrow the boat to go overseas. And the Chinese language media in Australia is the boat. Okay, so they see them as both the actor and the target of Chinese soft power public diplomacy. Now, this is a very important uh, cultural implication that going on. I, I won't go into that. I don't have time to go into that, but I'll leave that question hanging for you. Now, the second implication for, for that is that in the second pathway the Chinese government has stopped is to see whether identify countries where they can actually uh, uh, um, Establish more or less uh, sort of uh, partnership with the mainstream media, by even bypassing the diasporic Chinese community, and that usually happens in locations where there is not a sizable Chinese community, and the and and the, the, the countries that, that they have established this kind of partnership relationship are not necessarily the so-called Western social liberal democratic societies, such as uh, Brazil or. Argentina or Indonesia, they formerly um, have a reasonably quite friendly a relationship with China, particularly Africa. Chinese media is going to Africa in a big way, right? So again, um, just because that content, that, that you access that content outside China doesn't necessarily mean it's not Chinese media. Now, what does that mean for uh, the uh, media, uh, ethnic Chinese language in media in Australia? And what does it mean for people like Peter Carley, who's just to speak and uh, spoken, and also is trying to very hard to retain the so-called uh, the uh, multicultural Australian audience, who uh, he imagines would have quite different cultural and the political and the sort of uh, as well as economic interests and the needs. And how does he position himself and his media differently so that he can actually? take care of the multicultural needs and the interests of the Chinese community, at the same time compete with the Chinese government and its media? These are the questions I would like to leave hanging with you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much.